again, everybody. My name is Dr. Jacob Gran, and in this video, we're going to bring our study of strict counterpoint full circle by learning about some composition exercises that combine all of the different species of counterpoint and every kind of voice leading dissonance in a full four voice chordal texture. In particular, there are a series of exercises that Tchaikovsky presents in his textbook on harmony that I believe he invented and that I find especially practical for improving the skill of composing four-voice polyphony. To understand why the Tchaikovsky exercises are so clever, we need to appreciate that counterpoint pedagogy was often very unclear on where exactly the finish line was for a student's studies in counterpoint. Fuchs himself, for example, ends the section on counterpoint in Gradus ad Parasum by showing this example of combined species. Each voice moves in a different species relationship to the whole notes of the cantus firmus, which occurs in the bass. Unfortunately, Fuchs does not explain how to compose such an exercise. He just mentions that the student might now be ready to try. The problem with this kind of exercise is that it's quite difficult, and also somewhat musically unrealistic. The effect of the equality of voices is unsustainable when all of the voices are forced to move in a rigid, rhythmic proportion to one another. The faster moving voices will naturally draw more of the listener's attention, and that will weaken the effect of polyphony. About 110 years later, Luigi Cherubini published this example in his French-language treatise on counterpoint, using the same cantus firmus from Fuchs's example. Cherubini composes the other voices in rhythmically free fifth species, rather than assigning each of them a fixed rhythmic proportion. Each voice is able to speed up and slow down in a very flexible way, so that no one voice dominates the texture. Also, the dissonances of this exercise are evenly distributed between all of the voices, and are also somewhat unpredictable, which also promotes an equality of voices and a very successful polyphonic effect. This kind of exercise definitely comes the closest to the ideal of voice leading independence that we would hope all counterpoint students would eventually reach. And it sounds quite reminiscent of Palestrina's style of vocal polyphony. However, just like Fuchs's example, it is extremely difficult to compose, and Carabini provides no actual instruction or advice on how to go about solving this kind of exercise. Tchaikovsky's solution to this pedagogical problem is very clever. He also aims towards Cherubini's multiple fifth species exercises, but he includes some new, easier exercises as stepping stones. Tchaikovsky imposes a speed limit on how fast each of the fifth species lines may move, and each of the speed limits is its own kind of counterpoint exercise. In the first exercise, the fifth species counterpoint voices are limited to only one note per measure. As you can see, this ends up being identical to traditional first species counterpoint in four voices, which we've already studied in a previous video in this playlist. <laughs> 
when Tchaikovsky allows each of the voices to move at a maximum of two notes per measure, that is where things get interesting. The voices now have access to first, second, and fourth species motions relative to the cantus firmus, and we can see in Tchaikovsky's example that the composer now has the ability to use dissonant passing chords on the weak beat of the measure, as well as dissonant suspension chords on the downbeats. For instructions on how these kinds of voice leading chords work, see the previous videos in the series. In the second part of this video, I'm going to demo how to compose this kind of exercise, so I want to point out now some of its other features. As I said, we can use dissonant passing chords on the weak beats and suspension chords on the downbeats. But there are also two kinds of measures that could be composed that don't include dissonance. First, we could prolong a single triad throughout a measure using a voice exchange. Here we see in the third to last measure, Tchaikovsky swaps the bass note F sharp for the tenor's note D, and vice versa. The harmony is unchanged. The only difference is that we have moved from a first inversion D major triad on the downbeat to a root position one on the weak beat. Voice exchanges may also take place between upper parts, which would, of course, not affect the chord inversion. We may also change chord between the upbeat and the downbeat. In those cases, we are limited to chord changes that involve root motion up or down by third, as in measure seven, or root motion by fifth, as we can see in measure eight. The reason these are the only two options is that the whole note of the cantus firmus must necessarily be a consonant chord member of both chords, either the root, third, or fifth. Raising the speed limit to three notes per measure does not introduce anything especially new, except that now voice exchanges may be filled in with dissonant passing tones. Dissonant suspensions may also be prepared on beat three of a triple meter and must resolve on beat two of the next measure. This type of exercise might also be an ideal opportunity to practice the voice leading of dissonant neighboring and auxiliary chords which we learned about in the previous video. The final exercise raises the speed limit to four notes per measure, and this comes out looking very similar to Carabini's combined fifth species exercise that we saw at the beginning of the video. Notice that although the voices are free to speed up and slow down at will, they always maintain a composite rhythm of four quarter notes per measure. In other words, somebody has to move on each quarter note beat. This kind of rhythmic hocketing is a very characteristic feature of the polyphonic music of J.S. Bach. For the rest of this video, I'm going to give a walkthrough on how to compose the second kind of Tchaikovsky's exercises, where each counterpoint voice must move slower than the speed limit of two notes per measure. I think this is the most instructive of the exercises, since it combines the two primary kinds of strict dissonance, passing tones and suspensions, while at the same time giving a taste of a full polyphonic effect. 
if you can compose this kind of exercise, you can probably compose fully idiomatic 18th century chord progressions. Just like in the first video in this series, I'm going to use the Feti C major cantus firmus, and I'm going to compose with the same workflow that I recommended in that video. I'm going to start with the cadence, since that area of the exercise is usually fairly formulaic. Then I'm going to compose the opening few measures. Then I'll design an interesting high point, or moment of maximum interest, somewhere near the middle. Then, finally, all that will remain is to fill in the gaps between those three sections. And, of course, if I end up painting myself into a corner, I won't be shy about going back to edit things. For a cadence, I'm going to use the 6-5 suspension chord that we learned about in the video on how to compose suspension chords. That gives the voices something to do on both the upbeat and the downbeat of the penultimate measure and it includes a nice suspension dissonance. You will notice that in the figured bass symbols, I included a slur connected to the fifth. This is a bit of analytic notation invented by Heinrich Schenker, and it's used to show that the fifth above the bass, in this case, is a dissonant suspension prepared in the previous chord. Let's listen to measures 13 to 15. Looking now at the beginning of the exercise, I can see that the first three notes of the Cantus Firmus ascend stepwise. It occurred to me that in two-voice first species, we could compose a very nice bass line in stepwise contrary motion. Now, there are many ways to counterpoint this segment of the Cantus Firmus. Too many, in fact. So you need to latch on to something to get your imagination started and this is what jumped out at me. The first three measures can be harmonized as a one chord in root position, a five chord in first inversion, and a six chord in root position, respectively. This would be perfect if we were composing in first species, but we need our fifth species lines to be a little more active. Our speed limit for this exercise is two notes per measure, but we still should try to have a composite rhythm of two half notes in every measure. I see at least two ways to elaborate the basic chord progression. First, the ascending third in the soprano voice in the first measure can be filled in with a dissonant passing tone. Second, we can suspend the bass voice into the second measure, creating a dissonant 5-2 suspension chord on the downbeat. I also decided to allow the tenor voice to move to an A on beat 2 of the first measure, in order to give it something to do, rather than just repeat the common tone G between the first two measures. This creates a passing 6-4 chord in the first measure, which I labeled above with a capital P. Let's listen to the first three measures. That's enough for the beginning. Now let's scan around for interesting opportunities in the middle of the exercise. Again, we need to find something to latch onto, and it's easiest to do that before we fill the page up with notes. For instance, I noticed this leap of a fourth in the Cantus Firmus, and it reminded me of a very nice kind of suspension chord that I had seen in the past. The note A here also happens to be the high point of the Cantus Firmus, so we want to compose something that sets the leap into suitable relief. The basic progression is from a root position A minor triad in measure 7 to a first inversion D minor triad in measure 8. To this, I'm going to add a 7-6 suspension in the tenor voice. This suspended seventh clashes with the sixth in the soprano. Recall from the video on suspension chords that we don't want to anticipate the tone of resolution in a suspension chord, which in this case is the note D. So to improve the voice leading, we can also suspend the soprano note 
C, so that both voices move to the octave D together on the upbeat. This means that on the downbeat, only the bass and the alto move in contrary motion, which is a great way to set the cantus firmus high point A into relief from the other voices. Remember that because the cantus firmus has to move strictly in whole notes, it needs a little more help than the other voices to stick out and participate on an equal footing with the others, and the oblique motion of suspensions is a great way to do that. Let's listen to measures 7 and 8. After the high point in the cantus firmus, I also want the soprano voice to have a nice high point or moment of maximum interest. That is up to personal preference. You might also want to plan out a low point for your bass voice, for instance. I want this moment to be offset from the cantus firmus high point, so I'm imagining aiming towards this high G in the soprano in measure 10. The notes C and G in this measure mean that we are going to have to have a C major triad, and so the tenor and bass are going to have to aim towards the missing notes of that chord. After a little bit of trial and error, I came up with this. Measure 9 is made up of a root position G major triad and root position C major triad with the cantus firmus G as the common tone between them. And the chord supporting our soprano high point G in measure 10 is a first inversion C major triad. Let's listen to measures 7 through 10. Now that our exercise is guaranteed to have a well-supported high point in the cantus firmus and a nice melodic high point for the soprano, let's try to fill in the missing gaps in our exercise, starting with this one. How can we connect what we've composed so far to the cadence at the end of the exercise? Even if the motion is mostly first species, can we still just build a voice-leading skeleton that we can elaborate later? I came up with this. Our first inversion C major triad in measure 10 can connect smoothly to a first inversion D minor triad in measure 11. And in the next measure, we can move through a nice passing seventh chord on our way to a root position C major triad in measure 13 that prepares the suspension for our cadence. Notice also that this soprano line moves in a very nice overall contrary motion to the shape of the cantus firmus for these last six measures. Now the whole note chords in measures 10, 11, and 13 need to be elaborated. There's a leap of a third in the tenor voice between measures 10 and 11 that can be filled in with a dissonant passing tone. This passing tone will be especially nice since the tenor at that moment is doubled in unison with the alto, so the two voices will clash very nicely during that passing motion. In measure 11, I couldn't find a good way to include a suspension or a passing motion, so instead, I allowed the soprano and tenor voices to leap to different chord tones in contrary motion, which also happen to form consonant suspensions into the next measure. As for measure 13, we have two problems. First, the triad is incomplete on the downbeat. It's missing its chordal fifth. And second, we need at least one of the voices to move on the upbeat. I could have composed another passing dissonance B in the tenor voice, but I had already done exactly that back in measure 10. So instead of repeating myself, I changed the bass line. This fixes both problems, since now we have a complete A minor triad on the downbeat, and we've even improved the shape of the bass line slightly, since we avoid scale degree 1 in the bass for a long stretch before it finally arrives again at the cadence. Let's listen to measures 10 through 15. <laughs> 
now for the gap between measures 3 and 7. Again, I recommend thinking in terms of our first species chordal exercises to plan out a general skeleton for the melody before then elaborating with faster note values. My first species skeleton came out looking like this. To elaborate measure 3 and connect it to measure 4, I chose to use a voice exchange between the soprano A and tenor C, since this would bring them both closer to the tones of the next chord in contrary motion. I then also suspended the soprano C as a consonant suspension between measures 3 and 4. The problem here is that now the C major triad on the downbeat of measure 4 is incomplete. We are missing the note E. That is why I also added a voice exchange between the bass and soprano. As for measure 5, I noticed that the note G in the cantus firmus is a common tone with the C major triad from the previous upbeat. These voices could be suspended across the bar line while still forming a complete C major triad, and the motion to the first inversion G chord can now be pushed back until the upbeat. Finally, to connect measures 6 and 7, I can use another voice exchange between the soprano and tenor of the D minor triad in measure 6, and with minimal adjustments, this can be smoothly connected to the A minor triad in measure 7. This solution to the exercise isn't perfect. I only managed to fit six dissonant chords into a 15 measure exercise. And I relied a little too heavily on the voice exchanges between measures 3 and 7. But overall, I think that this demonstrates the kind of voice leading and thought process that you should follow when you attempt this kind of exercise. Let's listen to the completed composition. That's all for this video. Please do leave any questions or thoughts in the comments section, and feel free to like and subscribe if you find the educational content useful. Bye for now.